All righty. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Sam here. I'm just going to make sure this is streaming to Facebook. Everyone just bear with me. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, with, bear with me. All righty, hello everyone on Facebook who's joining us live. Welcome, welcome. Everyone on Zoom, welcome. Everyone hear me okay? Everyone on Zoom, everyone hear me? Good, thank you, Rebecca. Everyone on Facebook, <clears throat> so just give me a thumbs up or a, a smarty face, just let me know I'm coming through all clear on the Facebook side of things. Hi, Sheila. Hi, Anne, Anna, Dawn. Awesome. I'm coming through on both. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, hang on. Loud and clear. Thank you, Haley. All good. Hope you're well. Um, how are we doing for time? One minute to go. We'll start, we'll start at seven just to give everyone the benefit of the doubt, um, which is not long. I hope everyone's well. Lots of faces I recognize quite a few that I don't as well. So if you're new, then welcome to the Ayurvedic Mentor and, and this series. Um, oh, thank you for all the thumbs up on Facebook. That's good. Everyone joining there. Lots of people joining. That's good. Um, <clears throat> okay, seven o'clock. Um, so welcome to the Alzheimer's Prevention Series. Uh, this has been kind of quite a long time coming for us. It was a real... It's been a real priority for the last probably 12 months to get this up and live. Um, but something always seemed to get in the way for a variety of reasons. And so now was the perfect time to, <clears throat> to, to, to finish the, the final details and this and get it out there. Um, and it's such an important one. We're going to do, um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the trilogy of killers in a minute, but we're going to do prevention series for all of those. And there's a lot of overlap between those, the aim being that hopefully we can implement this very sustainable framework that includes clinically proven evidence-based preventative approaches that impact upon Alzheimer's, heart disease, and cancer. Um, and that's a real priority for us. But Alzheimer's is the one that we wanted to kick off with um, because it because the numbers are terrifying. The numbers are really, really, uh, that would terrifying is the only word. If you look at, you know, you go, you, know, you go back, five years, you know, cancers and heart diseases were the runaway problems. In you know, three or four, you know, three or four very short years, Alzheimer's. So the statistics for this year are suggesting that Alzheimer's is now going to be the leading cause of death in Britain, um, which is a terrifying prospect because there's always new advancements for cancer treatments and there's always new advancements in surgeries for heart diseases and cancers that doesn't exist for Alzheimer's. So it's a really terrifying statistic. Um, but the aim of this series is to, uh, is, to, you know, is to look at the evidence that's refuting that, look at the evidence to say it doesn't need to be this way. It's about the evidence, really, really profound cutting edge research to show how you know, a large proportion of Alzheimer's is now a preventable disease. And if any disease needs that remodeling, that, that, that Reperception is Alzheimer's. Okay. And I think this is such an exciting area. Um, and it's it's going to be really good to go through this um in, in detail over the next six weeks. It might overrun, it might run into kind of a seventh week, uh, maybe even an eighth week. We'll see. It depends upon I'm not going to rush it. Um, you know, the whole aim of these sessions is that one, they're super informal, and two, they're you know, they're interactive. So if you if we're going through and anything you want more details on, you want to reiterate, you want to ask questions, you want to know how it relates to you as an individual or to you as a diet, you know, how does it relate to your dietary protocols or medicines you're taking or this, that or the other. It's really important that this is a, is a, is a safe platform where you can ask questions around that. So you, by the end of it, you know, that this, this, these kind of series are only useful is if by the end of it, you've actually got a framework to implement into your life. Because if we can do that, as the years and decades unfold, we have the capacity to impact upon our risk factors for Alzheimer's in the same way we do for cancer and heart diseases. You know, if at the end of the course, yeah, it's interesting, but we can't actually implement it, it's been a waste of time. Okay, so you know, anything that's going to stop you implementing anything of the things we're talking about, or you want details on how you can customize it to you, it's really important that you ask. Okay, so we're going to take it, we're going to take it slow, we're going to cover it in detail. <clears throat> 
Um, tonight, we're not getting into any specific modalities. We're not going to get into any specific treatments um, or approaches. Today is very much about introducing this because before we dive in, it's really important to create that foundation of where we're coming from. Where, where does this research come from? Why is it such a beacon of hope in an otherwise very bleak clinical situation? Um, and what are we actually targeting? What, you know, we know the, the evidence is there. It's unequivocal. It's irrefutable that the evidence is there. But what's the evidence actually targeting? What are the clinical targets? What are we actually trying to do in, in all of this research and in this series? Um, and, and today is about homing in on that and providing a really solid foundation on why these approaches are so are appearing to be so successful and inducing you know, such significant gains. And what's so interesting is that since this research has really gained traction, um, more success has been obtained in the last 10 years than in the last 40 years of pharmacological treatment. OK, and that's not to belittle, you know, drug, drug therapies or drug treatments, but it's just to show that that doesn't work for Alzheimer's. OK, um, so that, that applies to everyone on Facebook as well as Zoom. If you've got any questions, then make sure make sure you flag them up. OK, um, so. Um, like I've, I've, I've kind of touched on this, but the motivation for this series is that we this trilogy of killers. OK, it's, I've, I've said this a million times. You know, all the courses, every, every course or, or talk or seminar or series we do, this comes up in some way, shape or form. Um, but, you know, it's important we don't let familiarity breed contempt with this, because what you know, the, the things that stop us living, you know, it's what people don't die of old age. People die of disease. OK, and what are the things that are most threatening to our our longevity what are the things that are stopping us getting into our late 80s 90s and 100s in good vital health if we take away those trilogy of killers our, our chances of having a, an extra 10 15 20 years of fit healthy happy productive life increase exponentially because you know for every you know 100 people listening to this or watching this about 95 between 90 and 95 of us are going to die for one of those three conditions okay like i said alzheimer's is what is the one that's on the biggest uh uh increase and the the the, the biggest thing is this 80 20 percent ratio okay and this was you know some of the most powerful research has ever been done we're talking multi multi tens of billion uh, tens of millions of pounds worth of research looking at what are the root causes of these trilogy of killers what are the at root what are the things that cause heart disease to develop, that cause most cancers, to, not all cancers, but most cancers to develop? What are the root causes of Alzheimer's and things like that? What we know is that between 70 and 80 percent of all of those causes are, are preventable, are, are impactable. They're things that we can minimize and in many cases completely remove through subtle changes to the way we live, the foods we eat, the lifestyle practices we partake in, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a massive statistic. It's really easy to skim past that without really you know, kind of meditating on it. But if we think about that, we're saying, well, 80% of all of the three diseases that are most likely to kill us prematurely, 80% of those can be prevented by subtle changes in our lifestyle. Only about 15 to 20% are genetic or uh, structurally orientated in a way that we, we don't have much capacity to impact upon. Um, that's a massive statistic. Even if that was 50-50, it would still be profound. But 80-20, you know, if we opened up the broadsheets tomorrow and there was a new drug that came out that was being marketed by Pfizer and it was, you know, if you take one of these pills every day for the rest of your life, your chance of dying from these three illnesses is reduced by 80%. Yeah, it would be the biggest selling drug of all time. And it's there for us. It's there for us, not in drug form, but in lifestyle form, in self-care form. And the evidence is so strong around this. So this series and over the next six or seven weeks, we're obviously focusing in on Alzheimer's specifically because the mechanisms for Alzheimer's are very different from the mechanisms for cancers and heart diseases and strokes. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of crossover as well, because, you know, if you look at the dietary protocols, yet yeah, they're Alzheimer's specific, but there's a lot of heart disease and cancer preventing mechanisms as well. Um, but we're obviously, you know, largely focusing on Alzheimer's. But the, 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 the fact remains that if we if we modify our behaviors, some of the foods we you know, if we can change our lifestyles, if we can use herbal medicines in a very safe and effective way 
we're chipping away at that 80 percent ratio and that's where we need to be we need to be we, we need to be tapping into that so our, our, our risk factors for these three diseases these three classifications of diseases is down to the 20 you know 15 20 percent ratio which is where we need to be and and the, the big thing is that this, we're not talking massive changes we're not talking sea changes in the way we live or the way we exercise or the foods we eat we're talking subtle sustainable simple modifications that over the months and years and decades become exponentially profound okay so that's 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 i guess the foundation of this it's about okay saying well that's that's general illness that 80 percent is general how do we funnel that into alzheimer's specifically and that's what we're going to be looking at um today um and what's so interesting about alzheimer's is it's the scourge of our time now. You know, if you look at if you look at the public health journals, if you look at the the opinions in public health, Alzheimer's is what is causing the sleepless nights because um, because it's it's proving you know so difficult not just to treat, not just to prevent, but to treat. You know, there's hardly any you know clinical success of, you know uh, available to us. But there's this brilliant article that came out, I think, just before the pandemic, just I think it was in February last year. And it compared to the other really terrifying illnesses of the last couple of hundred years that were, you know, feared above all else. And we think about things like polio, you know, polio was, you know, it was it was decimating communities and countries. Think about leprosy. You know, even cervical cancer going back, you know, 20 years ago, leprosy and polio virtually completely eradicated. The rates of you know, cervical cancer through screening are, you know, it's one of the biggest successes in, in the whole of oncology because we've pretty much, we haven't completely eradicated it, but it's not far off because the screening is so good now. Um, and the reason they're so relevant is because what that shows is that, and there's loads more, there's loads more diseases and pathologies that fall under this umbrella of illnesses that were terrifying that are now preventable or manageable. HIV AIDS, going back even 10 years, it was a death sentence. Now it's something you live, you live with like type two diabetes. You can live you know, a very, very long, healthy life with HIV AIDS. What does that show? It shows that through progress, through scientific progress, through medical progress, through innovation, these terrifying, devastating illnesses have been eradicated, have been either eradicated or managed so effectively that they no longer pose a threat to our health and our longevity. And um, I truly, truly, genuinely believe that that's where Alzheimer's disease, and actually I'll put AD there as I'm going through all these slides, I've, that just stands for Alzheimer's disease. If anyone's wondering, just because it's a bit of a mouthful to always write that down so i'm just going to refer to alzheimer's as ad um but i genuinely genuinely believe that if we were to fast forward now you know 15 20 maybe 25 years the framework the perception of alzheimer's would have changed fundamentally and i'm not saying it's going to disappear like leprosy or i'm not saying it's gonna um be as easy to manage as things like hiv aids is now you know, which is largely very manageable. What I am saying is that um, the ability to, to prevent it or to, re to, to slow down when we get it, to reduce the, you know, the, the age we get it at. So if, we got, if we we're going to get it at 60, we might get it at 80 or whatever it is. Um, and to slow down the progression of it, if we do develop it, I think we're going to see a complete paradigm shift in, in our ability to achieve that. Um, but the single biggest difference with Alzheimer's is that it's never going to come from a drug. Okay, that's that's if you look at the neurological, if you look at the neurologists, if you look at the experts in this research, um, they're pretty unanimous now that it's the 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 the, 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 the giant strides in this in this field aren't probably going to come from drugs. That's not to say that drugs aren't going to play an integral part. You know, we're not anti-drugs. We're pro drugs as long as they're being used in an effective way using a drug because there's no other option that's often not the best idea but there are you know hopefully that if these two things are going to go hand in hand we can have these very profound evidence-based lifestyle programs that are proven to prevent and reverse and manage alzheimer's if we can get those gains and then we can join them up with progressive drug treatments 
that's where we're getting into the holy grail land where we can make massive inroads okay but as it stands now the the, the all the buzz all of the excitement isn't coming from drug research it's not coming from vaccination research it's coming from lifestyle medicine it's coming from self-care movement it's coming from lifestyle protocols and that's so exciting because that's something we have complete autonomy over we have complete control over that um and i can you know this i remember I remember going back to when I was working at Southampton, you know, 10, 11 years ago still, um, and reviewing some of this research for a work project and kind of you get those initial um, kind of jangling of the bells that this is going to be something really special, really excitement, really exciting. And <clears throat> keeping track of that research over the last decade, particularly over the last three years, I've never seen um, in integrative medicine, non-drug medicine research induced the level of excitement, the level of impact, the level of kind of publication impact, the results that I've that the the, the, the outsider specific research has, has, has shown. Um, you know, some of the results in terms of um, quantum, I mean, the big thing here is the evidence-based nature of what we're talking about. This isn't, it's not subjective, it's not debatable we're talking brain scanning we're talking mri we're talking blood work we're talking you know alzheimer's assessment programs we're talking hard data here and the ability of these kinds of interventions the things we're going to be covering over the next six or seven weeks to change the structure of the brain to change the functionality of the brain to change the chemistry of the brain um to change the, the you know to, to to protect against the damage that causes alzheimer's it's almost unbelievable. It's almost it's difficult to believe that these non-drug treatments are able to induce these level of gains, and almost to the point where you you know I must have read the you know, the, the research papers you know ten times each to make sure that you're not missing something, to make sure that the wall isn't being pulled over your eyes through clever statistical work and things like this. But it's not. The evidence is there. It's 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 and it's it's compelling, um, and it's important to. Uh, to overview why lifestyle medicine has achieved infinitely more than drug-based treatments have in the capacity of Alzheimer's. Um, and uh, the big thing is this difference between a magic bullet and a magic net, okay? Because I'm sure most of you would have heard, you know, this idea in medicine of magic bullets, you know, the magic bullet for cancers and the magic bullet for strokes and the magic bullet for, you know, heart disease. And that's, true in some cases you know in cancer there probably is going to be a magic bullet where there's a singular treatment and immunotherapy might be that which is significantly effective for treating cancer in 80 percent of the time but there's never going to be a magic bullet for alzheimer's there's no it's, it's not possible it's like trying to get a round peg through a square hole it's never going to happen um, and that's you know aside from why which we're going to talk about in a minute the evidence shows that you know in the last 30 years, billions and billions and billions of pounds of research or dollars of research um, has been spent on Alzheimer's drug therapies. And if you get Alzheimer's now, the treatment you're going to get is going to be very much the same as what you would have got 20 years ago, with a few subtle differences. Um, and the standard treatment is monotherapy, a singular drug that is used to, to slow down progression. Okay. Um, so to spot why is it that in, you know, if you look at cancer, there's new types of chemotherapy, there's new types of hormone therapy, there's new types of radiotherapy, there's immunotherapy, there's been advancements. Why, why hasn't that happened with Alzheimer's? And there's two key reasons that, that underpin that. The first one is Alzheimer's is not a singular disease. Alzheimer's isn't one disease. There's several different types of Alzheimer's. Um, and there's never gonna, you're never going to be able to get one, med, one drug, one medicine, that's going to be effective in all of those. It's going to need, we're going to need different treatments for different types of Alzheimer's. What's caused the Alzheimer's? How's it progressing in any given person? Drug-based drug medicine doesn't work in that multifactorial nature. It does not, you're never going to get a one size fits all in, in that context. But the bigger issue, the more important issue, is that some of the most exciting research that we're going to look at the thing that's really teased apart why we why the, the the experts in this field have gained such success using non-drug treatments is the realization is the is the picking apart of the fact that 
Alzheimer's doesn't develop through one thing. Okay, but I'm just, you, people talk about the amyloid plaques and the tau proteins and all the things we're going to talk about later. Um, but there's not one thing. If you go to cancer, cancer is a single cell that hasn't got the, the command to die, so it keeps on splitting. It's a singular mechanism. Alzheimer's doesn't have that. For Alzheimer's to develop, there's, there's multiple factors that need to have gone wrong that combine to make a perfect storm. And if you have even a couple of those things missing, then Alzheimer's is probably not going to develop. It's where you've got three, four, five, six of those factors all um, active at one time over any given, you know, over months, years, decades, that causes that, 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 that significant shift in the brain that actually causes Alzheimer's to develop, okay? And the factors that are responsible are so variable, I, you know, the research suggests it's almost going to, it's probably impossible that you can ever create a drug that's going to be effective at inhibiting all of those different mechanisms. It's not possible. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's just not a feasible, realistic goal to have a drug that targets that many mechanisms. And it's probably not realistic to have a drug for each and use them all concurrently because there's too many mechanisms and it's, it's, it's not, that's probably not realistic. So, in and so that's not, like I said, no part of this is alternative medicine. There's no part of this which is saying conventional medicine is rubbish. This is the only way. It's about taking the very best of this integrated medicine and combining it with the best of kind of drug-based medicine. But I think drug-based medicine on its own is probably never going to be enough for Alzheimer's. And that's what the research very, very clearly shows. Okay. Um, everyone happy with that so far? Anyone got any questions about that before we, before we move on? All good? Um, everyone happy on Facebook? Who's here? Hi, Pat, Anna, Sheila, Chris, Diane, Steve. Hope you guys are all well. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so yeah, so when we're the, 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 I guess the springboard for why so much success has been had in the last 10 years using the approaches we're going to look at is because of this unpicking, this identification of the variables that have to be in place for the structural damage in the brain to occur. Um, because if you can identify what's causing those, then you can block them. You can block the root cause of them. And if you can block them, then we have this capacity to, to you know, really prevent the damage occurring in the first place, which is the best case. But if it has already developed and we've got you know, very early symptoms of Alzheimer's or we've got you know, diagnosed Alzheimer's, the same mechanisms are integral to, to slowing down and managing Alzheimer's, but in many cases, reversing it. There's very clear evidence now around people who gained you know, huge, huge improvements in their memory, their recall, their cognitive agility using you know, this framework. You know, um, incredible, incredible outcomes. So by, you know, it's like that saying, you know, you can't, you know, you can't, well, you can't get to where you're going, where you want to be, that you know where you're going. You can't, you need an endpoint. And that's always what's been missing with Alzheimer's. What, what physically is going on that causes the brain to unravel, that causes the tangles that make Alzheimer's? And they've been picked apart now. Um, and so, so, so much of it comes down to something called APP, okay, amyloid protein precursor. And it's um, it's hard to overemphasize the significance of of kind of what we're going to talk about now in terms of you know um, bear with me guys um, getting to the real kind of root cause of what we specifically need to be targeting to prevent the structural damage that that, that Alzheimer's induces. What you know what is the almost the linchpin? And this isn't the only thing by any stretch of the imagination. As much as the evidence is strong, there's still, there's still loads of unanswered questions. There's still loads of unanswered questions around, you know, why people progress at different rates, why some people get Alzheimer's very early and some people get it very late. You know, taking genetics into the equation because there's obviously a very, very significant genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's as well. Um, it's not, you know, it's not exclusively lifestyle based. It's obviously a very, very significant genetic factor. There's loads of questions around these kinds of issues. 
but most of them lead to, to APP because I think if APP is being addressed and is being mobilized and is being encouraged in a, in a, in a preventative way, it seems to cover most bases in terms of protecting our brain from, from you know, the, the, the early stages of Alzheimer's. Um, and one of the things that's really worth emphasizing, which is why this is much more of a preventative based program rather than a treatment based program, is generally speaking now, the consensus among the, the, the leading neuroscientists and neurologists in this area where in Alzheimer's is that the seeds for Alzheimer's are sowed are sown rather about 15 to 20 years before the onset of the first symptom. Okay, that is, I wouldn't say it's, you know, it's unanimously accepted, but probably 90% of the field now accept that that's the reality. That if someone develops Alzheimer's, the first symptom at 70, the structural damage that led to that at 70 was initially sown at about 50 to 55. Okay, so it's about, there's about a, 15, 20 year latency period. And that is where kind of the magic happens, I suppose, because we all get all, you know, as we age, our body always damages, you know, the body is this, you know, we, it rejuvenates, but obviously damage is a damage and, and destruction and, and, and degeneration is, is a, is a process of life. Um, but if you've got, you know, say someone's listening to this now, hypothetically, and you're 55 and you've got no symptoms of Alzheimer's or no memory issues or anything like that, but you've got the first untangling in the brain, you've got the first build up of amyloid plaque, it's minuscule, completely insignificant. But that's left unchecked as the years, you know, five years, seven years, 10 years, 15 years until bang, suddenly the subtle symptoms kick in. If that person was to intervene at 55, when there's this minuscule damage, this very, very insignificant, tiny, tiny initial seed of Alzheimer's that's been sowed, if they intervene then, they can keep it there, they can keep it at that level, or they can significantly slow down the progress. So rather than having a symptom at 70, they might, best case, never get a symptom, or it might be at 85 because they've slowed down the process. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're 70, it doesn't matter if you're 80 listening to this or if you're 40 listening to this, it's still relevant, but it's, it's most relevant if you haven't got symptoms or you've got very, very minimal kind of just general, you know, where are my keys rather than you know, obvious symptoms because the seeds for these kind of problems, they, like I said, they had this 20, you know, 15, 20 year latency period. And that's where the power is. That's where we really have that huge capacity to intervene. And so much of that intervention needs to target APP, okay? Because it's probably on, on, the, sh on the overall weight of evidence, it's probably the most predictive factor of who gets Alzheimer's, why they get Alzheimer's, when they get Alzheimer's, or what age, and how quickly it progresses. Uh, all things being even, even taking into account genetic, you know, uh, variables, it's 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 probably the most predictive factor. Um, and the st very strange thing about APP is that it's either the most the, the most protective Alzheimer's preventing function of the body, or it's the most Alzheimer's promoting factor of the body. It's either profoundly healing, it's profoundly preventative, or it's profoundly promoting. So it's, 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 the, it's the best and the worst. It's the most protective thing we have, or it's the most damaging thing we have, depending upon the conditions within our brain, okay? Depending upon the conditions, the environment within our brain, okay? And that may, it's one of the very few situations in the body where that's the case, where you've got a mechanism that goes back to Homo erectus. This goes back to you know, 250,000 years ago before we even existed as a species. That's when APP was laid down. Um, so it's this ancient process in the brain that is so powerfully protective and so powerfully damaging depending upon what's going on. And that's a very unusual situation because usually something's protective and it's protective something's damaging and it's damaging. It's not both things. And this APP is both things. That's really unusual. Um, but the 
biggest thing, the point of one of the, when we summarize the, the series at the end of it, one of the big take home messages at the bottom there in bold is that what makes APP Alzheimer's preventing or what makes APP Alzheimer's promoting comes down to the environment within the brain. And 80% of that environment in the brain is down to the things that we do or the things that we don't do. Okay, it's under our control. So that means we've got this root cause of Alzheimer's or the root cause of preventing Alzheimer's. And we have the capacity to, to switch it from bad to good based upon the environment on the brain that we have control over via the behaviors we engage with, the foods we eat, the herbal medicines we take. And that is so encouraging. It's the, probably the, the one of the few uh, beacons of hope in Alzheimer's because we have control over it. OK, um, I've just got some questions pinging up. So it's amyloid protein precursor is a is a I'll, I'll go through it now. It's a it's a it's a protein. It's a it's a neural protein that uh, that kind of I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll talk about it now, Haley. But yeah, it's a, it's it's a it's a protein in the brain that is activated in the way that protects against amyloid plaque and, and structural damage or in, or promotes it. Okay, so um, so when the when the the environment within the brain, and this is really important because everything that we're going to be looking at over the next six or seven weeks is based around this environment, okay, making sure the environment in the brain promotes APP in a way that is preventative. This is kind of the whole backbone of the series is based around this, okay, because if the environment in the brain is, is positive, so if the inflammation in the brain is down, if there's minimal toxicity in the brain, if our brains are able to feed freely on glucose, all these kind of things, I'll go through them in a minute. APP, the, this protein is cut, it's, it's snipped at different sites in the brain. So it's, like, so it's like turning on a light, it's like you know walking into a dark room, you turn the light switch on and that sheds light. APP is kind of the same thing. It's, it's cut, it's cut, the, the, the protein is cut. And depending upon where in the brain it's cut, it will depend upon what it turns on and what it turns off, okay? So when the environment in the brain is in simple terms positive, and we'll talk about what positive is in a minute, APP is cut at specific sites in the brain. There's one particular site called the alpha site, the alpha site. And when the protein is cut there, and when it's activated at that specific site in the brain, it signals something called tropic factors, tropic factors, um, which are signals, which are, you know, um, um, uh, signals, messenger molecules, which says, OK, let's stimulate repair, let's stimulate growth, let's stimulate regeneration, let's destroy amyloid plaque formation, let's inhibit um, inflammatory damage, that's clear toxins. It stimulates a cascade of chemical changes and structural changes in the body that repair, rejuvenate, remove all of the risk factors, all of the things that are shown to promote, cause, progress Alzheimer's. Okay, so tropic factors, something called brain derived tropic factor. And all they are is just, um, we'll, we'll cover this in more detail as we go through the course, but tropic factors are anything that stimulate repair and regeneration okay so when when the when the, the the brain senses that it's in a healthy place in a good place the environment within the brain is really really good and clean and strong and safe this app is cut in a way that stimulates the brain to repair itself to rejuvenate itself to restore itself in a way that inhibits the primary mechanisms of alzheimer's okay um before I move on, is everyone happy with that? Anyone got any questions about? I've just got a question pinging up. Um, oh, cool, great, Hayley, all good, good, good. Um, so essentially healthy brain chemistry equals tropic responses, which causes APP to inhibit Alzheimer's promoting mechanisms. But if the brain is in a negative environmental state. If the brain in, in, in myriad ways, then this is why that research I spoke about at the start is so important because no one knew what 
a negative environment look like? You know, what is a negative environment? That's only helpful if we, can, if we can identify what's making it unhealthy so we can target that. We didn't know that. The research wasn't clear on that, but now it is. So if those negative factors are active in the brain, APP is cut at, a, at two different sites. So rather than being cut at the alpha site, which prevents, it's cut at two different sites that, that this is this is as heavy as it gets in terms of science. If you don't worry, this isn't the, the whole course isn't like a crash course on neurology. Um, but it's important that everyone's really clear on this because it's 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 the linchpin. If the APP is cut in or in it, the other sites, it's something called synap synaptoclastic signaling, okay, which is a real mouthful. But what it says, what it essentially says is to the brain is that the environment that you're existing in is is damaging okay it's toxic it's inflamed um it's 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 damaging the safety of the brain so what i'm going to do is to protect the brain i'm going to shut it down okay i'm gonna i'm gonna remove remove um kind of the synapses that are essential for memories to flow I'm going to shut down areas of the brain to prevent them being damaged. So actually Alzheimer's is almost a prevent, is a protective mechanism. It's where the brain shuts itself down to protect itself from damage, even though the shutting down is more damaging than what it's trying to protect from, if you see what I mean. Um, so when the APP, when the brain senses a negative environment over the, the years and decades, as the APP is continually cut in, in a damaging way, the functionality of the brain drops. There are less synapses. Um, the, 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 the neural pathways that, that allow memories to flow break down. The, the brain doesn't clear itself of toxins very well. It doesn't regenerate the myelin sheets. The whole structural and functional health of the brain begins to dip. And over one year, that's not going to induce any difference. Over five years, hardly anything. But over that 20 year, 20 year latency period, someone is 55 and just a little bit of damage. 60, a little bit more damage. 65, quite a lot more damage. 70, they're suddenly diagnosed with Alzheimer's. It started 20 years ago and it started with this. It started with the, with the, the synaptoclastic signaling. It's, it started with APP being cut at the wrong sites, causing the brain to shut down in simple terms, okay? Um, so APP is so, so, I think we're going to see loads more around this. We're going to see so much, you know, it's, it's going to really, I think, explode into, into the news. And I, and I hope it does because we have control over it. We have control over the environment of the brain. But ultimately, it's, it's good or it's bad, depending upon the way the brain is working. Okay. Um, does, does that make sense? I'm just going to check Facebook. Hang on, everyone on Zoom to make sure there's no questions on here. Any questions? Everyone's on, everyone happy on Facebook? Everyone happy on Zoom? Anyone got any questions around that? Because it's really important. Well, we're going to revisit it as we go, as we go, you know, through the course. But it's really important for me, you know, at this point of the course, to, that everyone's happy with if we're creating a structure in the brain that is deemed healthy, APP is going to be cut in a way that prevents Alzheimer's mechanisms. So the holy grail is how do we do that? How do we make sure that, that the APP is being cut in the right places of the brain? Okay. Um, so everyone's good with that. Everyone's happy with that. I've got questions. Will there be a PDF document? Uh, there's not as, as, as yet, but I could definitely knock one up for sure. Yeah, if that, if that would be helpful. Um, definitely. Uh, but is there anything specifically, Jeanette, that you would like more clarity on? Okay, cool. All good. Um, anyone else got any questions about APP? Any, everyone happy with APP? Everyone's good on Facebook as well. Um, so, So the reason that that, that um, oh, I've got a question. Yes, you'll get all the slides. Yeah, so, so those of you who are new to the mentor, 
everything we do, every live, every series, every video is, is, is recorded and it's um, uploaded to the Ayurvedic Mentor website. Okay, so you'll get um, you'll get the slides, you'll get the recordings, you'll get everything. Okay, um, so that so uh, uh, Liz, that will be uh, all up there. Okay. Um, Battery is running out. Um, so yeah, so there's the, 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 I guess what's what's changed the whole framework of this area is one the understanding of why APP is is so powerful. Um, oh, I don't know how you're doing that. Someone's drawing over the screen. I couldn't do that if I tried. So that's um, that's impressive. Um, so <laughs> um, so APP the discovery that APP is so integral to what's going on to why. Alzheimer's develops in the brain, that is, you know, game changing. But the even more powerful factor, like I said, is that so much of, of the stimuli for whether it's harming or healing comes down to controllable lifestyle factors. And, and that is, it's hard to, it's hard to do justice to the significance of that. Um, because if the, if the factors that cause APP to become damaging or APP to become healing are down to you know, lifestyle factors, then if we can intervene with small, subtle, sustainable changes that create an environment that signals to the brain to cut APP in a, in a healing way, that's, that's what's being, that's being labeled as the holy grail of Alzheimer's prevention, because you're getting to it at the root cause. You're not trying to slow down a mechanism. You're not trying to stem the tide. You're actually, you're actually, you know, reprogramming the brain to, 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 to be protective of the mechanisms that cause Alzheimer's in the first place. It's the ultimate model of prevention. Um, and the really big thing is that, which is why that latency period is so, you know, so important because we want to get on it now. It doesn't matter what age you're at. It doesn't matter if you're, like I said, you're 80 or 50 or 40, whatever. We want to get on this now. But if it requires really unrealistic um, overhauls of our life that are impossible to comply with, it's not much good. It's not much value. It's not practical. This stuff has to fit our lifestyle. It's, it has to, it's not about us fitting it. It's not about us, you know, so fundamentally changing the way we live our life that it becomes, you know, uh, unpleasant or unmanageable or very, very limiting. It's about saying, well, how do we take the best of this evidence and make these very small, subtle shifts that we can comfortably sustain for the rest of our lives? Because I'm convinced that if we could you know, say we, we had the way, the capacity to get this into everyone in Britain and say, right, if you need to do X, Y, and Z, you know, every week, every day, every week on an ongoing basis, the evidence would suggest that we could change the, the whole public health model of Alzheimer's probably, you know, over a 10, 20 year period because we're, we're, we're getting to the root cause of this APP in the first place. So it really is a bit of a holy grail. Um, so the obvious question that stems from that is, well, what are these factors? What are the variables that predict whether APP is cut at the, the healthy side or the unhealthy side, okay? And this isn't an exclusive list because there's dozens of, uh, this, is a, this is a minefield because um, as soon as they realized that APP wasn't just genetic, it wasn't just down to genetic risk factors, it wasn't down to the genes you carry from your mum and your dad, it is that, but it's also much more, it's controllable lifestyle factors. It was then picking it apart, well, what? And obviously that's a, that opens up a can of worms, it's a Pandora's box. But in terms of gain for effort, in terms of where the research and evidence is strongest, these are the primary targets that impact upon the structural and functional changes in the brain that have to, to conspire to, to, to sow the initial seeds of Alzheimer's, okay? Uh, and that these are all things we're going to be targeting. So for each of those risk factors, there are antidotes as such in dietary protocols, lifestyle protocols, herbal medicines, detoxification, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they're not in any particular order, but the reason I put an asterisk next to the insulin resistance is because it's probably one of the most powerful signals for an unhealthy brain environment. Okay, because the brain brain cells, you know, uh, brain, our brain cells use a phenomenally disproportional amount of energy compared to the rest of the body. It's, the, it's an energy hungry monster and it needs glucose. You know, the, the glucose is how the brain fuels. 
And as soon as our brain cells become resistant to glucose, so insulin resistance just means that they're glucose resistant. So insulin carries glucose into a cell. So if a cell is resistant to insulin, it means the cell can't get glucose. The insulin can't carry the glucose into the cell, which is you know, essentially type two diabetes is where our cells are insulin resistant. But when that happens in the brain, that's the halfway house to the floor, okay? If our brain cells are resistant to insulin, then essentially they're starving to death in a sea of glucose. There's plenty of glucose in the brain, but it can't enter the cells. So the cells begin to die because they haven't got the fuel they need to, to function. They function at a fraction of their of their you know their possible capacity, um, and it doesn't matter if everything else is being taken care of. If our brain cells aren't sensitive to insulin, if our brain cells aren't able to feed freely on glucose, it's everything else falls by the wayside. Okay, so it's absolutely fundamental, probably the single biggest thing that we, we help facilitate brain cells that are really, really responsive and really sensitive to insulin and glucose so that they're, they're feeding abundantly. They're getting all of the energy they need to burn brightly, okay? Um, and so there's lots of ways of making, there's lots of ways of achieving that. There's changing what we eat, there's changing when we eat, there's changing how we eat. It's about inducing something called autophagy. It's about gentle fasting, but, um, it's so, it's so, 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 so important. And what's interesting as well is that the mechanisms that are used to, to create brain cells that are really sensitive to glucose are also incredibly beneficial in terms of cancer prevention and also heart disease prevention. So as a general you know, health and longevity approach, it's really, really key. Okay, so we've got to make, and even, there's even research looking at um, general, not, not Alzheimer's, not pathological changes, but general age related um uh, cognitive impairment so say you you know you're you you, you, know, you maybe laugh with your husband or your wife or yourself that your memory is not what it was or you forget words or you you know you, we're not talking you know like i said pathological changes like alzheimer's but just age related decline in memory if you make your brain cells more sensitive to insulin you see a discernible improvement in a few months. And there's evidence to show this, your brain gets sharper, your memory recall is quicker, your, your cognitive agility is more adept because your brain has got the fuel it needs. So it's so, so, so important. We really intervene to make sure our brain is, our brain cells are receptive to insulin. Um, that's not a stupid question. That's another ground rule. There's no stupid questions here. You can ask what you want, but yeah. So what causes insulin resistance? So insulin resistance is caused by, or it's caused by lots of things, but it's primarily caused by having too much glucose. So too much glucose. So having too much sugar, too much refined white carbohydrates. So as as our, if we've got a processed, refined, you know, high moderate high sugar diet we've got more glucose in our blood and in our brain. So our body has to secrete more insulin continually, year after year, secrete more insulin to, to deal with the higher glucose levels. And as we're living with chronically elevated insulin, the cells become um, immune to it. The, the cells become desensitized to it because there's so much of it. And then suddenly they can't use it. So what causes insulin resistance is eating the wrong foods at the, at, or too much food, too much wrong food and at the wrong times of the day and grazing. So the mechanisms are very clear. What causes it is very clear and how to antidote it is very clear. And there's some specifics that are unique to the brain, you know, um, because we're not, we're not dealing with type two diabetes here. You haven't got to be type two diabetic, you know, to have insulin resistance. You could have pretty good glucose scores. So there's some brain specifics, but I do think getting a blood glucose test, going to Boots and spending 10 pounds and getting a week's worth of blood glucose testing and to take your fasting blood glucose scores every morning before you eat or drink anything. I think in terms of pound for pound disease prevention, if you know over a week or two weeks that your blood glucose is really nicely in the green zone, then, you know, 
we know you know, cancer cells can't fuel without glucose. We know high glucose levels, you know, insulin resistance is linked to cancers. We know it's linked to heart disease. We know it's linked to Alzheimer's. If your glucose levels are good, your fasting glucose levels are really in the good zone, your risk factors plummet. Okay, so that, you know, that might be worth, if you're, if you're worried about things like Alzheimer's, if, you, if you've got a risk factor or you're, you're really want to maybe up the ante, that would be a really useful thing to do because if you if your if your fasting glucose scores are kind of close to the amber zone or in the amber zone or kind of moving towards the red zone, then you, you that you have to manage that. Okay, so it's it's really really important. Um, Damn the sugar, yeah, nothing I know it is nothing good comes from it other than the the ten seconds it's in your mouth or whatever it is. It's a it's an absolute nuisance, but. And I, I sympathize because I've got the worst sweet tooth in the world. So I know how kind of difficult it is. Um, uh, how are we doing for time? Um, so the other key area, so preventing insulin resistance, making the brain cells really sensitive is key. Um, we've got to get inflammation in the brain down. Chronic, low, moderate, low level inflammation is the brain is one of the key signals to an unhealthy environment that causes the the APP to split somewhere else. Um, we've got to directly intervene to, to, to minimize amyloid plaque because amyloid plaque is what actually causes the brain to unravel. Okay, so we've got to chip away at that. And that's where the herbal medicines become so important. Really compelling clinical trial data to show how quite a few different product herbal medicines can, can remove and prevent amyloid plaque formation and tau formation. So we want to target the actual structural damage. Um, and we've got to give the brain the nutrients it needs. It, the brain needs a set variety of nutrients to, to, to create an environment where it's, it's optimally nourished. And unfortunately, a lot of those food groups are not favoured you know, in, in the Western palate, things like the bitter green vegetables, you know, things that research is showing that our tongue is losing the taste buds for, we're de-evolutionizing de because we're not eating enough of it. So there's, we need to give the food, the brain specific nutrients, healthy fats, things like that. Um, one of the new frontiers is neural toxicity. Um, mercury, lead, you know, all, all um, agricultural chemicals, so many of them, because the brain is about 60% fat and about 80% of the toxins we put into the body are fat soluble toxins. So they want to store in fat cells. A lot of those store in the brain and we, the brain has natural detoxification pathways. If it didn't, we die, um, but they're not designed with the toxicity barrage that it's facing in the 21st century. So we've got to proactively intervene to support the brain's natural detoxification pathways and the body's natural uh, detoxification pathways. And again, there's very clear evidence that you can see a discernible improvement in memory recall cognition through doing that. It is research to show that just general age related memory loss and decline. If you're helping the brain detoxify, things perk up. OK, and that's even truer. Hang on, guys, let me just turn my charger on. Hang on. There we go. Um, and that's even truer of if you're combining it with insulin. You know, so if you're making the brain more resistant to insulin, uh, sorry, more sensitive to, to insulin and you're helping the brain to toxify, you're getting exponential gain. So if you're listening to this and someone's thinking, well, my memory is not what it was, or I forget words, or it's not as sharp as it used to be. If you, if you just made your brain cells more sensitive to insulin and you help your brain detoxify, I would bet my bottom dollar that within probably 16 weeks, you would notice a discernible difference in your cognitive sharpness. So that's what the evidence shows. Um, we wanna be making sure sleep, those two things go hand in glove because one of the key mechanisms for brain detoxification is, is during sleep. So again, very clear evidence that we have broken sleep, um, dysfunctional sleep, you know, not, I'm not talking for a short period of time, you know, like, you know, the couple of years for having young kids, I'm talking you know, over decades, we've got to get sleep under control. We've got to be making sure we're getting, you know, your seven, eight hours of restorative, rejuvenative brain healing sleep. Um, 
things like neuroplasticity, we need to be stimulating the repair and the regeneration of the, the structural aspects of the brain. Okay, so um, <clears throat> these are all of the things that are profoundly healing or profoundly harming, depending on whether we're ignoring them or whether we're targeting them. And the framework we're going to be looking at is built around all of those. It's around, you know, if we're doing a set number of things every day or every week, by the end of every Sunday night, if we look back at that week, we can comfortably say, I've done things that reduce inflammation in my brain. I've done things that increase insulin sensitivity. I've done things that have helped remove amyloid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole framework that we're going to be looking at is built around those two things, making sure that the APP in the brain is cut at the healing site and facilitating that by making sure the environment in the brain is, is optimal by those, you know, those mechanisms there. Okay. And that's the whole structure of what we're going to be looking at is how do we do that in a very sustainable simple evidence-based way okay um is everyone happy with that any questions about any of those variables there why they're so important um obviously i've, I've this is just a snapshot we'll be covering insulin resistance and, and insulin sensitivity and things in a lot more detail um so you know if you're wanting more explanations on that that will come but um got a question I use essential oils for my dad. It helped us in the short term. There were big re reversals. Sadly, we found all this too, too lazy out. So we progressed so far. Yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm sorry uh, to hear that. But yeah, um, all of these things, you know, essential oils, um, we might actually, it's funny you should say that, because we, we, we might do a bonus session on that. Because of the olfactory system, and so the olfactory um, nerves in the, in the nostrils, the olfactory nerves, you know, how we smell, they have the, the most direct pathway into the brain. So the ability to use essential oils and, and the olfactory pathways to stimulate brain responses is uh, a real kind of wellspring, I suppose. And there's, there's really, there's a growing foundation of research. And I, there wasn't space to fit it into this into this framework, but we might, I might do a bonus session on that just because I, actually, I was reading something about that on Monday, interestingly, and it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. So yeah, definitely the, you know, essential oils, herbal medicines, they're very, very similar. Okay. Um, happy, yeah, we, I'd love to, yeah, I don't want to make you cry, um, but I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to see what you did and what oils you use, because I can compare that to some of the research that I've got, um, but I can appreciate why it will make you upset um because it's pretty unpleasant um so what are we going to look at we're going to look at um kind of a simple sustainable uh alzheimer's preventing dietary framework which is based upon four levels things we should be doing abundantly every day things we should be doing in moderation every day things we should be doing every week and the things we need to try and do away with so really simple we're not talking overhaul we're talking simple herbal medicines Evidence is so, so strong here, really, really exciting. Um, detoxification, like I said, creating insulin sensitivity is, is mandatory, um, neural plasticity. Um, so that's kind of, it's, it's gonna be fluid. There's always stuff coming out and it might be that a new research paper comes out in between sessions and we change what we're talking about. It's all about making sure we're up to date. So it might, there's gonna be a bit of fluidity. And like I said, you know, most of the six week courses we run will often become seven weeks and sometimes even eight weeks. So I'm not going to I'm not going to I'm not going to whiz through it if it if it needs more time or give it more time. And if you can't make those sessions, you can watch the recordings. Um, but so it, there's quite there's quite a, a, a chance it might all change. Um, uh, I would also love to hear what you did, but do not want to make you cry. Yeah, I'd love to hear what you did. I'd love to hear what you did, but I definitely don't want to um, make you sad. Um, particularly this late at night because it's going to affect your sleep maybe so maybe um, maybe you could tell you what you could if you'd like to uh, maybe you could email me and I could share it next week if, if that would be less difficult for you maybe um, but I'm sure everyone would love to hear what you did yeah, particularly if you saw reversals that quickly um, okay if you yeah, that'd be great if you could email I'd be really grateful um, and then one last thing before we, before we finish, um, and it's an important thing. Oh, um, where are we? And it's just a final caveat that 
obviously this is called the Alzheimer's prevention series. So the lion's share of what we're looking at is obviously is about that latency period. We're not symptomatic. We haven't got a diagnosis. If you're over 40, particularly if you're over 50, there's a chance that those seeds, that initial structural damage may be there. We don't know. It's about intervening there. So it's preventative. OK, because because of that, we don't need to be as aggressive. We don't need to be as rigorous. We don't need to be as, um, you know, really throwing the kitchen sink at it because we don't need to do that. If we're preventing it, we can chip away at it because we've got time on our side. Um, but if you're listening to this, if you signed up to this or you're listening to this because you've got overt symptoms, you know, that are above and beyond just general memory dysfunction or you've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or someone, you, you family member or friend has got Alzheimer's, the approaches we're going to be looking at still hold true, but they need to be more and they need to be more aggressive. OK, and they need to be more tailored. What are your insulin scores? You know, um, what are your ketones? You need you need you need you need a much more robust protocol to, to obtain the benefits that we know are obtainable. So if you're listening to this and that applies to you, it's not something we can cover in this course because it's not something you can generalize. What we can do is we can signpost to you to loads of information and we can signpost you to uh, labs and people who can give you kind of the full battery of workups to, to customize this. OK, so um, this is about prevention, um, but there's a lot more information if you are diagnosed. OK, so if that applies to you, then do do email us and we can we can signpost. OK. Um, but I'd imagine most people here are probably in the in the in the camp that I just spoke about, the, you know, the camp that I'm in, um, which is where you know we're not symptomatic, we haven't got a diagnosis, but we want to we want to act early to make sure that that latency period is 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 nipped in the bud, okay, which is what this this is all about. Um, so hopefully that's laid the foundation to what the course is about what we're going to be looking at why and why this is such an exciting area like i said it's hard to do justice to just how profound this research is it's it's you know it, it couldn't come too soon because it's needed um but it's such an exciting time and i think you know it, we we truly for the first time ever have a framework that has the capacity to really reduce our risk factors for this and that's that's manner from heaven because it's you know a pretty devastating illness so um, so as of next week, we'll dive into the actual content. We're looking at um, the kind of the dietary levels, like I said. Um, if you're new here, then uh, try, if you can, if you're on Facebook, try and join the Ayurvedic Mental Facebook group, because that's where we can share more resources, loads of interaction and questions on there. So if you've signed up, make sure you do join the Facebook group. Um, any questions, do let me know. Uh, any other questions on here before we wrap up? Uh, or are we all good? Uh, you're welcome. Thank you, Haley. Um, okay, well, I'll let everyone go. Um, oh, that's another question. Ah, thank you, T. Um, have a lovely evening, uh, and I look forward to. Uh, well, I'll be, we'll be. Obviously, we're always interacting on the mentor Facebook page. But any questions, let us know. Uh, and if not, I'll see you all soon. Uh, and have a lovely evening. Take care, everyone. <laughs>